Thanks for coming out tonight. This is very exciting. I am thrilled to be here. It's my first time in Westchester, and it's been a delightful time. Um, I have plenty of things to say, as always, and I've been asking Raymond off and on today, so what's the level of this? What level should I be hitting this at? And I, and I don't know, and it probably varies quite a bit. So what I'm going to say is I love dialogue, and so I'm going to say some things, and I'm going to pause and I want you to ask questions, so I know if you're tracking with me and maybe it's stimulating some things for you. So I'm going to treat this not like this sort of formal lecture up here, but I'm going to treat it like I do my classroom, which is, please, I want to hear from you. I want to dialogue with you. So I'll, I'll say plenty of things, but don't be afraid uh, to, uh, to jump in with any questions. But I'm going to ask you to do something here at the beginning, and that is... Um, either if you have a piece of paper, you can write this on there. If you want to use your phone in a note, I want you to answer this question succinctly, and that is, how do you find happiness? It's a big question. You can answer it however you want. What does it mean to be happy? How do you find happiness? Something on those lines. Just write down your answer to that. And if you're in your first year of marriage, obviously you're supposed to write your spouse's name down. Okay, we got that one. And now going beyond that, now answer it. Just give you 30 seconds or so. How do you find happiness? And I'm hoping you'll have an answer so I can write a bestseller. That's what I'm hoping. So pass those in. Just kidding. Uh, th so this, why don't you just think about this. We'll come back to this issue here in a second. All right, now, in his international bestseller, Sapiens, the Oxford-trained historian Yuval Noah Harari, I'm curious if any of you have seen this book, uh, Sapiens, okay, uh, he ambitiously traces human history over what he understands to be a two-and-a-half-million-year process of evolutionary biology, um, Harari isn't just writing a large-scale history of human civilization, which would be a, a, quite a task overall, but he's actually writing a history of the human species itself. Homo sapiens, that's us, are simply, he says, an animal of no significance that has ended up dominating over other genera, other, that's the plural of genus, animals. We've outlasted other human species. There were other human species, as he argues, Homo Neanderthal, Homo Denosovan. Um, and he says that in the unpredictable and uncontrollable process of evolution, Homo sapiens went through three revolutions that enabled us to outlast all other human species and to have a place now in the Earth's ecosystem that's so advanced that we could even write books about ourselves. And he describes the three Homo sapien revolutions as the cognitive, the agricultural, and the scientific. And he says, basically, we, Homo sapiens, rule over the world of all other creatures for the most part because we alone, among animals, can believe in things that exist only in our imagination. So this mental ability to imagine things like gods and money and nation states and rights, things that actually don't exist physically, that are only in our minds, that enables us to sort of advance over all other species. Now, Harari is a highly educated homo sapient, and he certainly doesn't lack self-confidence in his description of human development, I can say, having read the book. And there are a lot of things I could say about his metaphysic, his understanding of the world. But the remarkable thing to note is that after hundreds, I don't know, three or four hundred page book of broad brush discussion, it's a beautiful book, it's well written, it's engaging, it's, the paper's really nice, it's just, it's a nice book. Harari brings the discussion down after all this two and a half million year history he goes through he brings it down to two final points in two final chapters one of the chapters the last one <clears throat> is his ponderings about what the future of our species is in light of genetic engineering and cybernetic enhancements but the other question harari asks in this international bestseller that's been translated into 26 languages is called, the chapter is called, And They Lived Happily Ever After. And Harari states the problematic question well. Here's what he says near the end of the book. 
The last 500 years have witnessed <coughs> a breathtaking series of revolutions. The earth has been united into a single ecological and historical sphere. The economy has grown exponentially. Humankind today enjoys a kind of wealth that used to be the stuff of fairy tales. Science and the Industrial Revolution have given humankind superhuman powers and practically, practically limitless energy. The social order has been completely transformed, as have politics, daily life, and human psychology. But are we happier? Did the wealth that humankind accumulated over the last five centuries translate into newfound contentment? Has the cognitive revolution made the world a better place to live in? Was the late Neil Armstrong, whose footprint remains intact on the windless moon, was he happier than the nameless hunter-gatherer who 30,000 years ago left her handprint on a wall in the Chavot cave? Are we happier? Harari asks. Are we happy? That's the question that we can't avoid, and I would suggest to you, nor should we. Now, Harari's answer is, in fact, no. We don't actually seem to be happier today, though he notes that's actually a very difficult thing to assess historically. We simply don't know whether a medieval peasant was happy. We can't just project our life experiences and expectations. We can't just look on, on a medieval peasant's life and say, oh, that must have been horrible because we don't know what their assumptions and what their expectations were. Additionally, discerning happiness, even defining it, that's what I'm curious what you wrote down, it all depends on how we define it. If we define happiness measured by material metrics, such as diet and wealth and longevity, as if these guarantee happiness, then you would think modern humans would be the happiest of all. But this is apparently not the case. The real issue, Harari notes, is that we can't define happiness as a kind of emotional mathematics. That is, a lot of times we do this, that we're happy if we have a sum of more pleasant moments than unpleasant ones. A lot of times people probably think of their happiness. You're, are you happy or not if you ask yourself that or ask somebody else? I think most people would just be able to answer that by saying, well, I generally more, have more positive experiences than negative. The average person today may have been enculturated to think of happiness this way in terms of mere emotions, but Harari points out that, quote, happiness consists in seeing one's life in its entirety as meaningful and worthwhile. As meaningful and worthwhile. And I think that's very important. Happiness and meaningfulness, I think he's right, entail each other. So he gives this example if you have a crying infant in the middle of the night, your interpretation of whether that is loving, nurtur lovingly nurturing a new life or being a slave to a baby dictator, that very different interpretation depends on whether you evaluate what you're doing as meaningful. If what you're doing really isn't meaningful, then it's just a, an inconvenience. St. Augustine, like countless thinkers before him and after him, boil down the human, the essence of human meaningfulness to this question of true happiness. When we talk about meaningfulness, we're talking about the universal drive to be truly and lastingly happy. Book 10 of Augustine's very famous massive tome, The City of God, begins this way. He says, It's the decided opinion of all who use their brains that all men desire to be happy. Happiness is what all humans want. People cannot not want happiness. This is what it means to have a brain, Augustine says. This is what it means to be human. I just expanded my deck. Um, I'm not a very organized builder. I just kind of build one post and figure out what's going to go. But it all worked out. So I, I expanded my deck up uh, higher and did curves around the pool. I was very proud of myself. Um, but while I was at Lowe's, buying some deck building materials one time i looked at the rack and next to fine woodworking and creative gardening in the magazine rack there was a magazine called the happiness formula how to find joy and live your best life and i had to buy it even though it was ridiculously 12.99 because i'm writing a book on this so i had to buy it and i can write it off the, the magazine is a glossy 95 pages of short articles pro tips charts and graphs about the science of happiness and in these short snappy articles, they tell us that modern science, by which they mean in this case a branch called positive psychology, teaches us 
what things to do and not to do to be happy. Eat right, avoid bad relationships, ride bicycles more like the happy Swedish people do, practice yoga. Even a home improvement store is offering us happiness today, right? And why not? I mean, after all, this is what it means to be an American. It's right there in our Declaration of Independence, isn't it? The great American experiment was self-consciously rooted in a French Enlightenment view of humanity that all humans are created equal with inalienable rights, although that has roots in the Hebrew Bible, I'd suggest to you. But among these three big rights that are given are, do you remember them? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I'm not being, smart, I'm not being snarky. There are plenty of problems with the French Enlightenment view of humanity and American culture, but I think they're on to something we were on to something that's bigger than France or the U.S. It's what it means to be human, as Augustine said, as Harari says, as Oprah says. To desire happiness, I would say, is as human as baseball and French fries are American. Now, the Greeks thought a lot about this. And the Greeks had a word for this ultimate meaningful happiness. The Greek word is eudaimonia which we can translate as, again, something like soul happiness or flourishing. And in his massive 500-page scholarly work, which is quite enjoyable to read, Happiness, a History, the scholar Darren McMahon discusses Herodotus, who wrote the first history of the West, and Herodotus' story is basically set as a quest for happiness, which can be described with quite a few Greek words, makarios, we'll come back to that one, which means happiness, Albios, which means prosperous. Eutychia, which means luck. But finally, he says, you know, the best word to sort of describe all this is eudaimonia, soul happiness, flourishing, that captures all these ideas. But even though the Greeks thought a lot about this, and they have a word for it, that doesn't mean it's easy to find it and keep it. Happiness is not only difficult to find and keep, it's really not even clear exactly what it is. If we were to look at all your answers, even among a pretty select group of people, self-selecting that you have, you're a Christian or you have some interest in Christianity and you're here in America at this time, even here in a very small population sample, there'd be a fair amount of variance in our answers. But if you took the question of happiness to the world and asked how would you answer that, there'd be a lot of confusion, I think. Augustine, right after the quote I gave you before, says this, but who the happy ones are and how they become so are questions about which the weakness of human understanding stirs endless and angry controversies. In other words, everyone has pondered, who has pondered the big questions of life agrees ultimately that meaningful happiness is the goal but we vary widely on what this happiness looks like and how to obtain it. For some people, we would say it's a religion of duty and sacrifice. Others would say it's freedom from any constraints and commands. For some, happiness is found in family, friends, and food, in being aware of the goodness and beauty of such things in the moment. For others, it's achievement and honor, success, wealth appear to be the way to capture elusive happiness, but it varies. It's another recent bestseller I just read by two philosophers, Herbert Dreyfus, who teaches at UC Berkeley, and Sean Dorrance Kelly, who's the chair of philosophy up the road a bit at Harvard. And their book, All Things Shining, begins with these lines. They say, the world doesn't matter to us the way it used to. The intense and meaningful lives of Homer's Greeks and the grand hierarchy of meaning that structured Dante's medieval Christian world, both of those stand in stark contrast to us today, to our secular age. The world used to be, in its various forms, a world of sacred, shining things. The shining things now seem far away, and this book is intended to bring them close. Did you hear it there again? Intense and meaningful lives and the grand hierarchy of meaning, which they describe memorably as shining, as experiencing the world, as having meaning. And what they say is, and here's the subtitle of their book, Reading the Western Classics to Find Meaning in a Secular Age. We're in an age now. These are two philosophers, not, not Christians. They're two philosophers. They're saying 
You know, when you look around life now, it's pretty meaningless. And there's a name for that. It's called nihilism. That at the end of the day, it's hard now that the kind of Christian view of the world in the West is broken down and we don't have a kind of ancient view of the gods like Homer did. It's hard to really know why anything we do really does matter. Really. And I still have those existential moments. Do you? I still, some days, I just think, does any of this matter? Like, why am I doing all the things I'm doing? That's a very normal human experience, but it's kind of, it's on steroids now in our secular age, and, and there's a name for it, and it's called nihilism. And the reality is that it, we live in an age where this is the normal air that people breathe, and it's a problem for us. You want to guess how many mental health professionals there are just in the just licensed mental health professionals in the United States? Any guess? 552,000 just in the United States. Those are just licensed. That's not including pastors and non-licensed counselors and others. You want to guess how many self-help books, how big the industry is of Here's the cool word for the night, bibliotherapy. That's the technical term for a self-help book, bibliotherapy. $10 billion a year industry, right? And I'm not mocking these things. I think we need mental health professionals. I think there's a lot of good in a lot of these books. But the point is, we're aware that figuring out what happiness is, is difficult. Now, I'd be curious if any of you here... When I asked you to write down happiness, maybe I wonder if anybody, your reaction, and maybe you even wrote it down, but your reaction might have been, that has nothing to do with Christianity. I'm about being faithful to the Lord or the glory of God. And maybe you've thought or maybe even wrote down, well, that has no, Christianity's not about happiness. It's the opposite of that. It's about self-denial. I won't ask for witnesses but I know I see you All right now if, if you wrote that that's okay I completely understand that I'd like to suggest to you tonight and what I'm going to try to argue for you and I want to get some feedback too is that indeed the Bible cares very much about this deepest of human questions this is not just a question for the 19 year old in their philosophy class at the university does life have meaning does a chair exist when I leave the room you know th those are those are the latter question is not as important as the first one, but the, the real question, does life have meaning? That's a deeply human question that we don't need to be afraid of. And I'm going to suggest to you that the Bible cares a lot, that God cares about that question, that that's not the opposite of what God's up to. God's answer to that is different than any other answer in the world, but it's still an answer, right? So let me pause before I turn to that and see if you... Want to ask any questions about what I said so far? I just said, I don't know, a thousand words or so. I'm curious if you want to clear anything, clarification, or any questions or any reactions. What are you aware of at this point? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good, thanks. Okay. So part of it is in English. So the question was joy. That's a, that's a biblical word that we're used to, right? Joy. So why are we talking about happiness? Part of it is an English problem in that our English word happiness is very weak now. Happy, we have kind of started to use that word to just mean emotional, temporary emotional positivity or something like that, right? And joy is probably a little more robust word, isn't it, in, in English still? Um, I don't know that happy as an English word is completely redeemable from a biblical perspective. And, the English word is not. But I want to suggest to you that the idea behind happiness, or maybe if you would allow this translation instead, human flourishing, okay, that that is a deeply biblical idea. So I've been using happiness so far, but actually that Greek word eudaimonia, that used to be translated in English as happiness, but as English has changed over time. So maybe 7,500 years ago, when, you, when we translated Aristotle, for example, who uses that word a lot, into English, we would use the word happiness. But now, m scholars will translate that same Greek word as human flourishing because happiness is so weak now in English. So that's the idea. So 
If I might offer a couple of biblical words, how about shalom? That's a Hebrew word that we don't really have a great English translation for. Sometimes we'll bring it over as peace, but no, that's not quite right in English either, either, is it? Because peace in English means more like cessation of conflict. It means a couple of things, cessation of conflict or uh, inner tranquility. But the Hebrew word, the Hebrew idea of shalom is, is something deeper. It, it means something more like human flourishing. It means like life in its fullness or something. So I'm, I'm using happiness in that sense, but I really appreciate the question because it, it's kind of an unfortunate turn that that word is taken in English. So, so joy is close. I think joy primarily focuses on the emotional part of it, not entirely, but more. And I think shalom or human flourishing might be a little better even than happy. So thank you. Other questions, comments? That's really important. Yes, sir. <laughs> Say it again. Yeah, between different cultures, yeah. Um, well, as I said with the Harari book, he's sensitive to the fact that going back in time, and I think you could probably say going across culture, it's pretty difficult to know how someone else might perceive happiness because it all depends on one's expectations, doesn't it? Right? And, and also, it depend, it particularly, so again, like if we think of like the life of a medieval peasant working 18 hours a day, having no change of clothes ever, you know, the idea of a shower, a hot shower or something, uh, living maybe 25, 30 years normally. If we look at their lives, wait, there's no way they're happy. But, you know, um, maybe they weren't. I don't know. I'm not recommending medieval peasantry as a sort of future for any of us. But um, I, I don't think we can really say in that case that they weren't. Because what if they're, they had actually a deep sense of their calling and that God was in control of all things and they were a part of that or something. That would actually be more meaningful than our third house on the ocean or something to us probably, All right? Um, now, when you talk about other cultures, yes, uh, sociologists, psychologists, social psychologists and others study this question. Um, I'm not an expert in it. I think there are probably some differences across culture today about what happiness is, but I think there's also some core to it that I'm going to suggest to you is also in the Bible, and that is this sort of with some kind of fuzzy edges, there is this core idea of life to, in its fullness is something, even if it might look a little different to different people. Great, great question. Maybe one more question or comment? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, happiness is when the. Yeah, when your happenings happen the way you want. Well, and I, that's that's good. And again, and again, I think in English, probably the word happy is too weak now. But I don't know if the speaker noticed this, but now you can as well. The reason we use the word happy, happy and happen are not accidentally coordinated. Happy means a good happenstance. That, that's where that comes from. That's where the word happy comes from, where our circumstances are good. And so then that gets to the question of how you define happiness. And this is part of the ancient discussion, actually. Does happiness depend on your circumstances? And that was actually a very intense discussion within the Greek philosophical system and the Roman philosophical system, but the Greeks started it. And that is one branch of the Greeks said no, and then this becomes what's called Stoicism and Epicureanism and others in the Roman tradition, which says it does not matter what your circumstances are. Happiness is completely, or flourishing, is completely a function of an interior process so that you could even be happy on the torture rack. Where others, like Aristotle said, well, I don't know if that's entirely true. It does seem like circumstances, happenstance is part of being happy, Granted, there's largely an interior element, but that, but that, so the point is, there's already a long debate going on way back. So we're talking 2,400 years ago on this question of what the nature of happiness is. We're just coming to it now, right? Okay, so let me press on. So 
you're probably beginning to put the pieces together, and you said, I thought this was a talk on the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, we're, we're getting there. The point is, busted, uh, the, the point is that I'm suggesting to you that the Sermon on the Mount, actually as part of the whole Bible, cares very much about this huge question of what it means to live life in its fullness. And if you don't like happy as a word, maybe human flourishing, maybe you don't like that. How about John 10.10 10, then? I've come that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. Now the problem is, when I read that verse, when I say that verse or you read it, I know what triggered in your mind, you were thinking heaven, right? Like eternal life. Like, in fact, that phrase, eternal life, when you hear that phrase, you think, um, well, you probably don't think eschatology. That's another word you think. But you think heaven in the future. I'd like to suggest to you that neither the phrase eternal life or the idea of life abundantly is primarily thinking about the future. It includes the future, but he's saying now. He's saying more, when he says I'm the way, the truth, and the life, what he's saying is I have come to answer the great human question of where true life is found. Yes, we understand Christianly that that also includes the future, but it's now as well. Now the answer he's going to give on that, as we're about to see in the Sermon on the Mount, is very nuanced and very shocking, right? But he's still speaking to this great human question of life. He's not just saying, I can't wait to get you out of here into a disembodied heavenly existence. That's not biblical theology at all. Okay, so what I want to do now is then really three things. I want to give you some background to what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount beyond what I've just done. That would be point two on the outline. I hope you all have that. Secondly, I want to show you how this works out in the Sermon on the Mount. That'll be point three. Oops, there's two point twos. Awesome. Thank you. That's my fault. And then, so two point, the second point two. And then thirdly, I want to just consider some implications. And I'll stop at each of these points and see if you have any questions. Okay, so Point, the first point number two on your handout, the sermon of the nexus of two contexts. So what do I mean by this? Well, in my book that a couple of you got, that's good, um, on the Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing, I talk about a lot of things, um, but one is about the history of the interpretation of the sermon, which is a big topic. But then I start by talking about this idea and this, this scholar named Umberto Eco, and I, won't have, I don't have time to get into all of his interesting stuff. But basically, what I'm trying to get at in the beginning of this commentary on the Sermon on the Mount is the question of what's going on when you and I read the sermon now that might be different than how somebody would have read the sermon in the first century. That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay? And to get at that idea, I want to talk very briefly about a very important idea of what's called cognitive linguistics or scripts. Now, that sounds very scary. Don't worry. Let me explain it this way. When I say the word house, the English word house, I know, because we know from brain scans and linguistic neurology stuff, that actually your visual cortex fired first. You don't, you're not aware of that, but you actually... Uh, something happened that you saw something. Now, you're, it probably happened so quickly you're not even aware of it, right? And then you began to process. And I can guarantee you that what, it, what didn't happen probably for most of you is that you didn't picture an igloo. Oh, there, you're, there your visual cortex fired and you were aware of it, right? You probably also didn't picture a flat roof that was diggable, through. You probably didn't think of like some, you know, yeah, you know, a roof, like the thing you could dig through, right? No. When I said house, you probably also didn't think of the place where you lay out your dead loved ones before they're interred into the ground, did you? Even though only a hundred years ago, and still probably most places throughout the world, that would be one of the main uses for your house, right? Have you ever considered why we have funeral houses, or we call them funeral homes, that are a weird thing because they look like a house, kind of, right? But then they are only have a purpose, and that is for funerals and visitations. It's a very odd thing, right? That's 
showing this older use of a house that's kind of left over, but our culture has moved away from. Probably, you, when I said the word house, you didn't think of, though some of you might have, especially in an expensive real estate area like this, a place where you and all your cousins and aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas live together. Maybe some of you thought that, but probably most of you didn't. Now, the point of this is, in this very short example, is that when you and I encounter language, it's not that the, what the words mean is just a function of we can look it up in a dictionary and know exactly what it means. How language actually functions is that it runs scripts for us. That is that when you and I hear a word, what that word does is it evokes images and narratives and associations that are deeply embedded in our culture. And they're going to vary by culture and by time. You with me on that? Okay. There's a basic insight of what we call cognitive linguistics. So, and, and in fact, the way our brains handle language is that we are making decisions based on a framing or what we call a control. So when I say watermelon, fireworks, picnic, I've not said anything about the 4th of July, but that's what's happening for you, right? Because you, what every word, how every word functions in our brains is a function of how it relates to other things that is embedded in our culture. Or I remember when after living in Scotland for three years and then we moved to Kentucky, I'd never lived in Kentucky, that I saw all this stuff that said UK. And I was like, wow, these people are like really into the United Kingdom. And it took me, I'm not joking, it took me like a month to realize, oh, University of Kentucky. Like I, I really thought, man, these people like the United Kingdom. That's kind of weird, right? Or, and I'm not at all trying to step, step on any toes here or cause any firestorms, one more example, when my wife and I, uh, we're, our family plays a lot of games, and when my wife and I, way back in college, we used to play a lot of card games, and there's a whole family of card games um, that are related to each other because the way they function on the low end would be something like uh, uh, Euchre or um, Spades all the way up to through Pitch and 500, and the highest point of this is um, Bridge. And do you know what all those games, they all have a family resemblance to them. Do you know what they're called? Well, they're all called Trump games. Well, at least that's what we used to call them. Now, when I said the phrase Trump games, you could not not think of the president. Even though 20 years ago, 10 years ago, when my wife and I would have talked about these different card games as Trump games, we didn't think of Donald Trump, and you wouldn't have either. Right, this is how language works. Now, where am I going with this? Here's the point. Is that when you and I read the sermon, we can read it, and God is happy to speak to us. I'm not saying that you and I can't read the sermon well, but there's a, a very important layer and a, and a depth to reading the Sermon on the Mount in any part of the Bible that will vary or we might miss if we don't understand what we might call the cultural linguistic embeddedness of the Sermon on the Mount. That's a fancy way of saying it. Um, but the point is, the Sermon on the Mount is coming to us in a real context with real people who use language in a certain way, right? And when, the more we can understand about that culture and what they mean by their words, the more we'll be able to read the sermon better. That's my point, okay? You with me on that? Let me pause. Questions? Any of that? Yeah, please. No, it's fine. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Well, I do think he speaks transcendentally. That's awesome. Um, of course. And the Holy Scripture in its entirety is above and beyond us, and God is happy to speak. That's why I gave that little qualification, but it's good to say that more. God is happy to speak, even in our very, of always imperfect readings of Scripture, our very imperfect sermons and our very imperfect Bible studies, God is happy to speak to us. So this, d d don't in any way uh, hear me, and I would not want to in any way discourage anyone from reading, studying the Bible. 
But the reality is also, on top of that, this is real human language written by real humans in a real time and space. It's more than that, but it's not less than that. Right? It is, it is God speaking, but this is why we need... Tra- and of course, this, these are, this is a translation too, right? Which is, these, we have great translations. We are very blessed, especially in English. We have this rich trove of translations, but anyone who's bilingual which most of us probably aren't here, but anyone who's bi or trilingual knows that translation is a tricky process, right? It's doable. You can definitely communicate across languages, but there's always connotations to it that, that are culturally embedded, right? It, can I just, anybody who's bilingual, can I get a witness, anyone? You, you know that this is complex, Japanese, right? I mean, you can translate, but, and, and you can translate well, but the depth, this is why at seminary we train and I train pastors to read Greek and Hebrew, not just for job security reasons for me, right? Um, and, and, and every Christian doesn't have to learn Greek and Hebrew, right? Most people, they're not called to that and not, it wouldn't be worth the long range time it takes. But the reason it's really valuable for some people to do that is because when you read the text in the original languages, you, you have a greater possibility to pick up on some of these embedded cultural clues. That's what seminary education is really all about. It's kind of just giving you an education so you can read the Bible better so that you can feed people like you, most of you here. So, so I want to affirm that God's Word always speaks above and beyond culture, and Jesus himself does, but it's not less than human as well. This, is, this book is, is a divine book written in human language, and so the better we learn how language works, the better readers will be, I'd say. Is that a sufficient answer? That's great. It's a great question. I really appreciate that. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah, please. Yeah, so the parts of it that are cultural. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, and let me just I'll kind of third down punt here and pull back up and say, um, this is why God has given teachers to the church. I mean, I just want that to sink in, right? God has structured His church so that everyone can and should read the Bible, but there are people that are called to give of their time based on ability and other qualifications to help other peop- help most people understand, right? And that is the ultimate answer to all these kind of questions is that God has called people to study to be leaders and teachers to the church. I mean, you just read Ephesians 4, for example. It talks about God has given first apostles and then teachers, and that continues on. There is a hierarchy to the, str- to the church, not in terms of value of people. Everyone's equally valuable. But in terms of role, there, is, there are differences, right? And so the biggest answer to that, I'd say, is this is why we need to study. <laughs> this is why we need scholars. This is why we need commentaries. This is why we need teachers who study those things and can give to them. This is why there are several pastors here. You're not, you're not paying your pastor money to have this like Sunday-only job or something or whatever you think a pastor does. What, what's really happening is people give money to a church so that a pastor can give themselves to study so that they, they've got a freedom to give themselves to study so that they can feed people from the Word of God. That's how to think about what the ministry really is. Right? And so my point, and, but everybody should be reading the Bible, but we all need helps. This is the point. And so discerning what elements are cultural or not, that's why we need scholars and that's why we need commentaries and good books that help us figure those things out. Right? Because greet one another with a holy kiss. There's a, there's a good example. Right? I did, nobody kissed me when I came in. Raymond? Okay. <laughs> So I think most of it, yeah, but some cultures do, right? There are plenty of Christian cultures that that is how you greet each other. And if they came in here, they might say, what, what kind of unbiblical Christians are you guys, right? Most of us in our culture would say that's a cultural element, not a universal element. But the principle behind it would be warmth and love for one another or something, right? But that, we need help from people to, to help us understand those kind of things is how I'd answer that. Yeah.
Absolutely. And again, you have to, so the question is, what about the Holy Spirit in all of us? That, that is absolutely true. That's why I'm saying every year you should read the Bible. We should be exhorting one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We should be teaching one another. And at the same time, the scriptures are very clear that there are teachers given to the church to lead. There are pastors, there are overseers, there are shepherds, there are instructors, right? And so I think you have to live with both those things being true at the same time, right? Great question. All right, one more question. Yes, sir. Please. You can get. Yep. So, so a good, yeah. So a good book, like a good concordance, is a help. Again, it's a kind of a dead teacher, is what it is—a teacher that lives on through writing. So, excellent. Thank you. Okay. So, let. So, what are wh what is this context that we're getting at here? Okay. Well, um, the first context I'd say to understand the sermon well is the Old Testament, right? And particularly, um, the, what I call here in context one, the story of Israel, and this sounds kind of fancy, but Second Temple Jewish wisdom literature, all that means is that, of course, you have the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and we really need to always be reading our Old Testaments. I love today in our liturgy here this morning, for those of you who are here, we had two long readings, Genesis 2 and First Kings somewhere. Um, that's amazing. And, you know, a New Testament church is always going to be reading the Old Testament. A Christian church is always going to be reading the Old Testament because it is the, the foundation of all of God's work in the world. Um, it's not easy to figure out always how to apply the Old Testament, right? There's a lot of tricks to that and a lot of debates, a lot of dif dif differences of opinion on that. But the story of Israel, the story of God's work from Genesis on, especially in the first five books, Torah and then the prophets, um, are really crucial to understanding the Sermon on the Mount. Um, tonight, we won't be able to do a detailed analysis of the Sermon on the Mount, but it's very clear. The Psalms and Isaiah 61 and Deuteronomy, uh, Genesis, all those books are really crucial to understanding the Sermon on the Mount well. But particularly, what I'm suggesting to you is that there develops, there's a part of the Old Testament that really becomes important between the Testaments in the time period we call Second Temple Judaism, which basically just means from 515 B.C. to around A.D. 70. So during that time period, especially important for Jewish people is the wisdom literature. And what is wisdom literature? Well, what, what, what books in the Old Testament would we typically call wisdom literature? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, uh, Job, right? Job is a big piece of narrative poetry. But it's very much wisdom literature. In fact, its, it's role is very important because it's kind of a critique of wisdom literature. Ecclesiastes is as well. And that is a flat-footed way of approaching wisdom literature because you remember Job's friends, what do they say? They all come to him and quote, pro they, they're quoting Proverbs to him, right? And they're wrong at the end of the day because suffering is like this bigger and, and the God's sovereign work in the world is bigger than just formulas of Proverbs. So Proverbs are good, but they're not the whole story either. So like Job and Ecclesiastes kind of serve in the Old Testament as kind of this wisdom literature and critiquing itself within. And nobody said this yet, but there's a bunch of psalms that we call wisdom psalms as well, like Psalm 1. Do you remember this one? Happy or blessed is the one who does not walk with sinners and stand, stand with them and sit with them, but instead his or her delight is in Torah and God's Word. And that person will be, they will flourish like a tree, right? This is, wis we call this a wisdom psalm. So my point here is that the Bible really cares, the Old Testament here, really cares about our flourishing because wisdom literature is all about teaching us a way of seeing and being in the world that promises shalom. I was meeting with the interns at lunch, and I said this to them, and so I'll say it to you as well. When you think of Proverbs 1 to 8 or 1 to 9, how does that whole thing function? Like, we're, we're familiar with the book of Proverbs, but how is the whole book of Proverbs framed? It's framed as um, a father saying to his son, 
here's these ways of being, these sort of ways of wisdom, and the appeal, right, to like be faithful to your wife, don't go the way of the harlot, um, don't be dishonest in business dealings, but always use you know, fair weights, all the kind of things that Proverbs talks about. Um, why? Like, why, why would a father say that to a son? Is it just, it's the right thing to do, gosh darn it, do it, right? No, the appeal is because if you live in this way, you'll find life. And if you live in this other way, it'll be destruction. Sounds just like Psalm 1, right? Flourishing or happy or blessed is the one who dedicates themselves to learning from God, not living foolishly. And again, what's the image at the end of Psalm 1? A tree that's flourishing and bears fruit in season and out of season versus chaff that blows away. The appeal of the Bible is constantly to, to say to us, don't you want to find real life? Don't you want to find life in its fullness, in shalom? And the way the Old Testament and the whole Bible ends up talking about this is with the image of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is a place and a space of flourishing. It's the hope for a time and a place when we are free from toil and labor and pain and disunity and violence and destruction and sin. What, what is that picture? That's life. That's what we are constantly being offered in the Bible. Or happiness, if you don't hate that word too much, if it's not too weak for you. Or flourishing, whatever you want to call it. Shalom, if you want. And the wisdom literature particularly, the whole Bible talks this way, but the wisdom literature particularly concentrates our minds and our hearts on appealing to us to, to learn to see the world in a certain way and be in the world in a certain way, to inhabit our lives in a certain way that we might experience flourishing. So that's the, I'm just trying to set up, like what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount? I haven't talked about the Sermon on the Mount yet, but I would say the first thing to understand about is that the Bible is talking a lot about that. But there's another context as well, and that is one that is not as familiar to us probably, and that's what we can call, it's letter B there, the Greco-Roman virtue tradition. Now, I could give lectures and lectures on this. I don't have time to do that. All I'll say is, kind of what I've been saying already, the Bible's not the only place in the ancient world that people are asking these same questions. The great Greek and Roman philosophical traditions are asking the exact same questions. So Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, you get to, in the Roman tradition, Epictetus, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, um, great emperor, they were all asking the exact same question. How do you find real life? Like, what's, what's the secret sauce? Like, what, how do you live in such a way to find real life? When you and I think about philosophy, we think about it as being completely meaningless, right? I hope I, are there any philosophy professors in here? I like them. I like you if you're a philosophy professor. But most of the time when we experience philosophy, it's like one of the great influences on my life. Steve Martin describes it. Like, then when you, Jesus and then Steve Martin are kind of my main influences. Um, Steve Martin, the comedian, says, you know, this is like from 1976 stand-up routine. He said, you know, geography, you're, you know, you get out of college, you don't really remember much of that or geology or whatever. But philosophy? You remember just enough to screw you up for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> and I think that's what most of us have experienced, like philosophy 101. Again, the teacher, you maybe had a crazy teacher like I did who kind of lectured against the board. He had chalk all over his pants, you know, as before dry erase boards, and would say, does a chair exist when we leave the room? How do we know, right? And, and you, you just kind of, you leave class going, I don't know, is anything real, right? Well, that's, that's understandable, but that's not what ancient philosophy was. That, that's not, and they did some of that kind of stuff, but what they really ca cared about in the ancient world is how do you live well so that you can find life? That's what Socrates cared about. It's what Plato cared about. It's what Aristotle cared about. It's what Seneca cared about. It's what Marcus Aurelius cared about. They all cared about that. And so I'm just suggesting to you that that context is actually important because when we get to the New Testament, you know what language the New Testament's written in? Greek. It's not written in Hebrew, interestingly. And do you know who's ruling at that time? What's the cultural heir 
at that time? The Roman Empire, right? In fact, we are already 300 years in to a very deep Greek influence and rulership over Israel at this time, over Palestine. Israel doesn't exist anymore, right? So the point is, we can't actually deny or we can't ignore this cultural context that is very much up and running for early Christianity. Just read the New Testament. You'll see Paul is constantly interacting with philosophers of his day, with cultural issues of his day, meat sacrificed to idols, and Roman governors of his day. The New Testament is situated in a real-life context of what we call the Greco-Roman world, the Roman imperial world, which is deeply influenced by Greek culture. And the way that people used all these terms and the way they talked was about happiness all the time. This is the great question. So what I'm suggesting to you is the Sermon on the Mount, this is letter C, the Sermon on the Mount and really the whole New Testament comes to us at this nexus point of two worlds that are colliding. Colliding maybe sounds too violent. Two worlds that are interacting. One is the story of Israel. And of course, Christianity is the fulfillment of the story of Israel. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises from Genesis on. But it's intersecting with the Greek and Roman imperial world. So much so that Christianity's holy documents are not written in Hebrew, but they're written in the language of the day in Greek. We just got to let that sink in. Right? This is the fulfillment of the hope of Israel, and the documents are not even written in Hebrew. They're written in Greek into a Roman culture. That's very significant because it shows that Christianity is, very, is unafraid of interacting with and engaging with its own culture. All right? Unlike Islam, which only can conquer culture. Right? You have to learn Arabic if you want to study the Quran. We have a kerjillion translations of this because Christianity is not afraid to recontextualize itself right? into the world that it's going into. So, what is the connection point where we can understand these two worlds colliding it's, or interacting? It's this question of happiness or human flourishing. Okay, let me pause. I want to be sensitive to our time, but let me pause and see questions of clarification or things that are being stimulated for you, ideas of any sort so far. Crickets? Okay, that's fine. You're just so amazed. It's all right. That's okay. Let me go on then. That's fine. Maybe this will stimulate more. So then, Roman numeral, the second Roman numeral two, clues for wisdom literature reading. Here, now we're getting down to it. I'd like to suggest to you that the most fruitful reading of the Sermon on the Mount is to read it as a piece of wisdom literature. Just like the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, recontextualized and interacting with the Greek and Roman world of its day. Okay? So what are some clues? Well, if you have a Bible, let's just, let me just show you a few things. This will have to be super quick for time's sake here. If you turn to Matthew chapter 5, which is what we're talking about on the Sermon on the Mount. How does the Sermon on the Mount start? If you were here for my sermon this morning, I said a little bit about this. We can say it again. Um, it starts with these things we call the Beatitudes, which is a very funny thing because we don't actually, that's not really an English word, Beatitude, except for here. It's kind of like hallowed in the Lord's Prayer. Like, we don't say that. Well, you got Halloween, All Hallows' Eve. I mean, you got uh, um, Deathly Hallows. That's another good one, right? So you got Halloween and Deathly Hallows. But other than that, we don't use that. It's not really an English word that we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's kind of weird. So, too, beatitude is not actually an English word. It's just a word we borrowed from Latin, the Latin word beatus, which any Latin lovers in here? I don't mean Hispanic people who are <laughs> suave. I mean people who love the Latin language. Um, you're all is welcome. Um, beatus means happy. It means flourishing. Right? So the reason these are called beatitudes, or the more technical literary term is macarisms, is because these are statements of happiness. I know your translation says blessed, 
And I don't have time to get into it, but that's a really unfortunate translation. It's understandable because we actually don't have a great word for this in English, but this is not the word for blessed. That's a different word. Yulagetamai, or in Hebrew, barak or baruch. Barak means to, to speak life into something. That's not this word. This word is makarios, which we don't really have a good translation for in English, but it means happy are, or flourishing are. But again, this, the same problems with happy. It's too weak of a word, right? And so what I end up translating it as, after literally spending five years thinking about this verse and these verses and reading everything in multiple languages on it, I came up with the very imperfect flourishing. Flourishing are you. Because I think that gets closer at the idea. Some older translations say happy. And if you read an old theologian like Jonathan Edwards or something, when the word happy was still stronger, it meant more like flourishing, you'll see he translates it happy and flourishing and blessed kind of interchangeably, right? But the, the problem with the word blessed here, it, it's not all bad because, of course, God is blessing us and we'll never find true happiness if God's not blessing us, of course. But that's not what these verses are actually talking about. They're not saying if God will bless you if you do X or something. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When you and I hear that phrase, we, we can't help but think, okay, I should be poor in spirit and then that will be a place of blessing. Okay? It's not all wrong, but it's just slightly off and that turns out to be significant. What this is saying and these nine Beatitudes here, nine macroisms, is that the state of true human flourishing is described this way. And in doing that, Jesus is standing in the long line with Moses and the psalmist and Plato and Aristotle and people after him, Seneca, Augustine, Aquinas. All the way to, he's standing in this long line of someone standing up and saying, I'm going to tell you where real life is found. That's what he's saying by saying makarios or, or flourishing or happy. And then here's the shocker. The stuff that Jesus says is crazy. It's unlike anything anybody else said before him or after him. Do you know what true happiness is? Poverty of spirit, he says. You know where true happiness is found? or flourishing, whatever you want to translate it, those who are mourning, grieving, longing for God to set the world to right, grieving for the sin of the world. Flourishing of the meek, you may say, oh, that's nice. Flourishing of the cheesemakers, if you know your Monty Python, forget it. Um, that's nice, they don't get much. Uh, but the point of flourishing of the meek is, that may sound nice to you, but meek means you don't get your rights. Right? Meek means you don't get the praise that you deserve. Meek means you're on the low end of things. Flourishing are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You say, well, that, that's positive. No, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, all this comes from Isaiah, all these Beatitudes come from Isaiah, is saying you, you see sex trafficking. You, you, you're aware that right now men are online booking flights to Thailand to have relations with a 13 year old girl and you say god have mercy god bring your justice in the world that's what hungering and thirsting for righteousness is very clearly talking about it's longing for god to set the world to right in this age of brokenness this time of brokenness right it's not a positive feeling flourishing of the merciful again you may say well that sounds really great but merciful again means someone has wronged you and you actually let that go. They slighted you at church. Maybe took more of the family money. Maligned you somehow. To show mercy means you actually, you actually let it go. You, act, you really do. And that's hard. That's the place of lowliness. Same way with peacemakers. And then if you don't get the negativity of it yet, verses 10, 11, 10 and 11 and 12, like if you didn't get it yet, it's like on the nose here. You know what happiness is? When you're persecuted for righteousness sake, when people revile you, who loves that? I love people revile me. It's so awesome. 
persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Oh, that's, you know, that's my hope every day, my daily devotion. Please, Lord, let be a day when people utter all kinds of evil against me falsely on my account. No, I don't want that, right? And he is saying, he is standing, Jesus is standing on the mount as the true philosopher of the world and saying, I'm going to tell you what true happiness is. Now, the only one that might sound kind of positive, and this one I still have some, you know, lots of wrestling with, but I, I believe verse 8 is the, really probably the heart of them all. Flourishing are the pure in heart. And the reason I think this one's more positive than the others and really is at the core of all the Sermon on the Mount is because purity of heart means singularity of heart. Pure like the silver is pure. It's, it's 100% pure. It's not, it's, it's um, 100% what it is, right? And so this is like really crucial. But the rest of them, so I think that ties into the rest of the sermon, but the rest of them are clearly states that the idea that this is happiness is just flabbergasting. But the big point here is Jesus is trafficking in the great human question of what is, where's life found? What's true happiness? And there's more we could say, but let me skip to letter B there. Again, you can't see this word in your English translations, but that's why I'm here to help. Um, and that is in 548, if you let your eyes rest there. After this long discussion of six examples of needing to have a righteousness that's from the heart, not just externally, he culminates it all with love for enemy and then says it in this way in 548, you must be, and our English translations say, perfect Erg. This is another word. We have great translations. I'm not trying to make you not like your translations. They're great. But there's a, there are some words that are really hard to translate, and this is one of them. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That sounds like it's saying, well, God does everything right all the time, so you better. And if not, you suck, basically. That's not what this is saying. The, the word here is, I give you to there in English letters, teleos, it means more like um, uh, complete or whole. Like, uh, do you remember, I hope this isn't cutting too close to the bone. You guys are probably happy about this. Remember a couple years ago when the Browns lost every game and people said they had a perfect record, right? Somewhat ironically, but it was perfect, meaning it was always L's, right? It was always losses. So the idea of perfect, that's an older sense of perfect. Like, it's always the same. It's consistent. It's whole or complete. That's what this is saying here, but unfortunately in English, that sounds the opposite of what this is kind of sounds like you have to do everything right. That's not what 548 is saying. It's saying, you know, that exterior behavior that you've got, that's great, but it also has to be matched by a heart that is attuned to God. So you, there's got to be a wholeness, a consistency between your insides and your outsides. That's what, that's what this is talking about. Does that make sense? Now, the reason I bring this up here is because guess who uses that word all the time? Teleos. Aristotle and the, and the great Greek tradition. I'm not saying Jesus got it from Aristotle. If anything, Aristotle got it from you know, something older than him. But the point is, once again, the Sermon on the Mount has these clues in it that it's speaking about the great questions of how do you find true meaning. Because for the Greek and Roman tradition, the idea of teleos is that the only way you can ever experience life in its fullness, eudaimonia, human flourishing, is if you live a life of teleosity, if I can make up an English word. If you live a life that is consistent, that is harmonious, your reasoning and your affections and your actions are all teleos. They're all in harmony with each other. If you don't live that way, if you live a disconnected, disintegrated life, you will never enter into fullness of life. That's the, that's the Greek tradition. That's the Roman tradition. That's how they argued. And I'd suggest to you that's how the Bible argues too. Pure in heart is the same thing. And that Jesus is doing the same thing here. And the, what, the place you find that kind of discussion is in wisdom literature. It's in philosophy. It's in philosophy of human flourishing or of wisdom. And then let me just say something super briefly about these. Two ways. Remember Psalm 1 where it said, you know, one way ends in flourishing like a tree, flourishing, and the other chaff. How does the Sermon on the Mount end? Well, if you flip ahead to chapter 7, you actually have three images, one of which I preached on this morning in 7.13. Narrow and wide, wide gates, see the two ways, just like Proverbs, just like um, Psalm 1. 
there, wisdom literature always functions that there's two ways. One is going to result in good, one is going to result in bad. Do you see it there in 7, 13, and 14? This is a two ways image. Right after that, true and false prophets that bear tr- good and bad fruit, two ways again. And then how's the Sermon on the Mount end? The Sermon on the Mount, how does it end? Verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise, wise. What's the final image Jesus gives? A wise person who built his house on a rock. The the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against that house, it did not fall. But everyone who hears these words and doesn't do them is a moron. That's the Greek word. Now you know a Greek word, right? The moron is what it is, right? That's where we get our word moron, right? It's a moros or moron is a fool, right? So you can be a phronomos man. That's the Greek word here. You can be a phronomos man or woman person, which is a term, right, from Aristotle again. You can be a phronomos person or you can be a moron. So notice the final image of the Sermon on the Mount is again a two ways that if you didn't get it yet, you know this whole book is about wisdom that leads to life or foolishness that leads to destruction. That's what this whole book is about. Okay, so let me then conclude with some implications, then we'll take the few minutes we have to see what questions you have. So my point is pretty modest here. I'm just trying to say the Bible cares about this great human question of meaningful happiness or human flourishing, okay? And I've written a book on it if you want to read more. I'm writing another book right now called, well, it's, the title's going to change, but it's currently called Jesus the Great Philosopher because you're not going to buy a book by that title, but that's what it is in my heart. Um, and it's, it's going to be arguing these things more extensively. But the idea is the Bible cares about, God cares about these issues, especially this great human question. And one of the places where I think you see it in like this concentrated tide pod kind of way is in the Sermon on the Mount. And so if we, what are the implications if we kind of rediscover this? And here's, the, here's my current subtitle of the book I'm writing on this right now. And that is Rediscovering Christianity as the True Philosophy of Life. Now, you may or may not like that. In fact, I'd like to know if you, if you hate it, if you won't buy the book. As a result, I care about that because I want to flourish in sales. Um, but the, the idea is there, whether, you, whether that subtitle makes it or not, rediscovering Christianity as the true philosophy of life. The idea is that I think for a lot of us who really care about the Bible and care about church and want to follow Jesus, philosophy, again, seems like it has nothing to do with our lives. Like that's weird and not helpful. And on the other hand, it's because we have this bad idea of philosophy, not the way it was in the ancient world. Or on the other hand, when you think you, your best life now or something like that, you, I assume maybe your reaction is similar to mine. I feel like, man, that's like really shallow and not you know, very rude in the Bible. And so what I'm trying to, and so the result of those kind of two extremes, I think we've lost something that I want to help us rediscover, that I'm hoping tonight, maybe I've just begun to watch your appetite, that actually Christianity and Jesus himself is really dealing with the things that really drive your every day. He really cares about the question that really nags you, does anything really matter? And how do you really find meaningful happiness? Now, we haven't had a ton of time to go into his answer, and we have to have a lot more time to go into his answer, but we begin to see part of his answer in the Beatitudes, which is that it's not what you expect. That ultimately, the only place you're going to find happiness and flourishing is an orientation towards God and his coming kingdom of heaven on the earth that is revealed to us through Jesus and being a disciple of him. I think we at least say that. We need to unpack a lot more complicated things too and difficult issues related to suffering and joy and all these kind of things. But all I'm trying to do is begin to help you see, to maybe insert a little thing into your soul and mind that you haven't maybe considered before, that the great questions that, that really drive all that you do, God really cares about those. Christianity is not this religion that's separate from these great human questions. That's what I'm trying to get at. Here's an image to close with. I think that we often view our faith and our li- well, actually, we view our lives like a chest of drawers, 
right? And for anybody who's a Christian, they have a Jesus drawer, right? And if you're like super spiritual, it's like a really big drawer, right? And if you're a pastor, it's the top drawer, right? And it's like huge, right? And then you have, we have all these other drawers, finances, friendship, relationships, family, job, career, um, you know, all kind of, you just name it, all these human questions. And I think we kind of treat our lives unintentionally like this chest of drawers and that Christianity is maybe really, really important to us. But it's the spiritual part of our lives. But I'm suggesting that while that is good for socks and underwear and, you know, slacks and other things, that doesn't work for us as organic beings. You can't separate your life your life into different drawers. It just doesn't work. You can try, and that disconnect is what will mess you up. If you try to disconnect and live a disintegrated life, and I'm just suggesting to you that even those of us who are really pursuing the Lord and really want to do what's right, we've kind of learned that the Bible is mostly about this kind of spiritual stuff, and then maybe some moral stuff and some doctrinal stuff, but it's not really about real happiness that's we either kind of feel like well i'm not it's not okay for me to care about that or it's not okay for me to really want that or we look to other gurus to get answers on that right whether it's oprah or harari or dreyfus and kelly or warren buffett or dave ramsey right you name it we all have gurus that we look to for all these other areas that we think are going to find happiness. And maybe we're okay because they're a Christian version of those gurus. But they're not really integrated into the rest of our lives. We're still kind of treating our lives if it's, it's this chest of drawers with these different ideas. Is that a helpful image? You see what I'm trying to get at? And I'm trying to say God really cares about the deepest human questions you have. He really cares about your happiness and your human flourishing. And he's speaking to that and inviting you to take his yoke upon you, Jesus is, so that you might find life and life abundantly. All right, I think we just have a few minutes. Any questions? I don't know if Raymond, you want to ask any questions or anything. What's coming up for you? Any, any questions, clarification, or any reactions? Please, yeah. 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 Can we strive for the purity of heart in light of our sinfulness? Yes, we can strive for it. We're never going to arrive at it perfectly. Um, But that is what it means to be a Christian, I think, is to be living a life where you're taking, you know, the image from Matthew 11, where you take Jesus' yoke upon you and you learn from him, as he says. And I think that learning is very much about our hearts. It's about learning to give all of who we are more and more into following him and to find a unity, increasing unity between how we think about things, how we, what's going on in our hearts and what we do. That's that kind of teleos unity. So of course it's always going to be imperfect and all of our happiness, all of our flourishing is going to be imperfect as well, isn't it? That's the longing for the kingdom of God to come upon the earth, which is at the heart of the Lord's prayer. As all these things are true, your name being hallowed, your uh, will being done, your kingdom coming, as those things are true already in heaven, Make them true on earth because that's when life will be found in its fullness. That's the idea of the kingdom of God coming to earth. Not that we're rescued and transported out of a physical world. That's not how the Bible ends. The Bible ends with God bringing heaven to earth. That's how the Bible actually ends, right? Because that then is shalom in its fullness. And that's what you long for. And I'm just trying to free you up and say, It's okay to long for that. It's okay to long to be happy. That's very natural. It's very human. But the only way you're going to find it is by taking Jesus' yoke upon you. That's the point. And it'll always be imperfect, but there's real joy, isn't there? That's why the New Testament constantly talks about joy in the midst of suffering. That makes no sense from a non-Christian perspective. Absolutely no sense. It only makes sense if you understand that he is talking about flourishing even in the midst of suffering is the point. Yep. Say it again. 
Yeah, the way I preach. Uh, I think a lot. I mean, it's been a long journey of me studying and thinking about these things, but um, I would say uh, that it's impacted my preaching and all my teaching and my parenting all in the same ways in that um, I've come to see that God is constantly inviting me into life, that the whole Bible is about wisdom, and it's, and it's an appeal to my heart to not be a fool in how I live my life, right? Maybe you think of Jim Elliott's great line, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, maybe in that kind of sense, famous missionary. But so as I think about parenting, as I think about preaching, as I think about teaching, I always am inviting people into life. I'm not you know, saying, you better do this because it says, right? Whatever. I mean, occasionally with kids, you do have to do that. I have six kids, I understand. Um, but what I, when I, especially as your kids get older, many of you have children that are grown already, you know this, you know, your relationship with them changes from authority to influence, right? You're always on this thing from authority to influence, such that adult children, you don't have any authority over, you only have influence, but you're on a journey the whole time. And so as kids get older, I especially would just appeal to them to say, son, you know, I, I know that um, you like girls. <laughs> uh, that's a good thing, actually, and I'm glad for that. That means your body's working correctly. You know, it means I'll probably have some grandchildren. It's all good, right? What I'm appealing to you in your relationship to girls, teenage son, is wisdom, that one way you can relate to girls is going to result in disaster for you and for her, and another way is going to result in life. And so the ultimate appeal is for their good. That's the way the Bible functions, I'd suggest to you. It's constantly inviting us into wisdom that promises life. So I think all this study over these years has just really kind of brought an articulation to that in my head. So good question, thanks. Yep. Yeah, the, what we typically think of as the gospel message, you right. mean, or something? Or is that what you're asking? Right, like his ultimate yep. purpose of finding salvation, how would you tie that into what he's doing here? Yeah, great. So the question, if you didn't hear it, how do I tie this into what salvation or the kind of metaphors or images we usually use? Um, let's say two quick things, and I think we probably need to be done then. First, um, the same philosopher who is teaching all this stuff at the end of this book and in all the gospels is going to die a sacrificial death to atone for our sins so that we can relate to God and know his blessings. So that part, I wasn't talking about that because I can't say everything in every <laughs> message. I was trying to focus on this, but that's absolutely right. You can't read the Sermon on the Mount apart from the story of Matthew where the one who's teaching these things dies on our behalf. And in fact, it was already back in chapter one. You'll name him Jesus for he will rescue his people from their sins, right? Yosh, uh, same name as Joshua. Right, Jesus and Joshua are the same name in Greek. So this is you, they will rescue your people. So the, the sin-bearing, uh, covenant-making reality is absolutely central to this. But how it organically relates, second thing I'd say is, what is salvation about? So this is part of the way we've, I think, not gotten it wrong, but maybe don't have the whole story. We primarily think about salvation as a salvation from. But I'm suggesting to you that it's really that, but more importantly, it's a salvation to something. It's a salvation to life. And in this kind of weird way, we have made the gospel and salvation primarily, if not exclusively, backward looking to being saved from sin. And that's absolutely true. It's non-negotiable. If, not, if we're not forgiven of our sins, we're lost, right? But that's actually only... That's a means to an end. The, the goal of God's work in Christ is actually not, hear me clearly, not just to forgive us of our sins. That's the entry into life. It's about life. We can't get to life without going through Christ's penal substitutionary atonement. right? But the penal substitutionary atonement is not the end goal of salvation. That's just the beginning. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. 
This is why Jesus is, Jesus isn't preaching justification by faith. You realize that, right? What is Jesus' message? The kingdom of God is here, and you can enter into it or not. The issue of justification by faith is a crucial New Testament doctrine because you can screw it up, right? You can think that you can earn your salvation by works or something. But the, that's, a, that's a secondary kind of like, that, that's a really important issue to clarify. But the big message of the gospel is the kingdom of God. Just read the gospels. I, I, if you don't believe me, just read the gospels. You'll see that's what the message is, the kingdom of God. What does Jesus come? He doesn't come and say, you know, you can, on this forensic imputation, you, can, you only receive justification through me. That's true, but that's not his message. His message is, I'm coming to bring life. I'm coming to bring the kingdom of God. You need to repent and follow me to enter into it. So I hope that makes sense. It's, to, to sum it up simply, the Bible is about not just salvation from, but especially salvation to something, and it's life. It's human flourishing. So, okay, I think our time's up. Thank you. You guys have been great. Appreciate it.